Hello everyone. I am eager for you to meet my friend Johnny McCoy. Johnny, welcome to the Pursuing Uncomfortable podcast. Well, I'm just thrilled to be here, Melissa. It's uh, great to connect with you, and I, uh, you know, I, I already feel great just just hearing your voice um, through the microphone. I can tell why your why your listeners enjoy your podcast so much. So thanks for having me. Well, thank you. And as you can tell, Johnny is a Southern gentleman, and he is very polite <laughs> and very gracious. And just going to put this out there: at some point during our conversation, he is going to call me ma'am. And I'm going to just blow this thing up and tell him to stop it and call me <laughs> Melissa. But, you know, with everyone here listening, I will have some grace and just appreciate you are who you are. So I appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. I Well, there it is. First one, I, <laughs> you know, in, uh, in, in, in my upbringing and then my upbringing transferred into, you know, being an attorney and having to, you know, make sure that I'm always on as far as manners and personality wise goes. But I'm I'm in recovery. I'm in re I'm I'm a, a southerner in recovery to the point where, you know, I, I know that I'm not going to offend you if I just say yes, even though that hurts. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is pursuing uncomfortable, but you you're not alone. We're here with you. But no, all kidding aside, Johnny, it's really such a a gift to me to have you here. I cannot wait for people to to meet you and become acquainted with all the incredible work that you're doing in the world and to hear your story and how you can impact others and give them hope. So let's just jump into it, shall we? Absolutely, of course. Thank you for having me again. And let's start out. I'll let you tell us about it. Tell me about your app and okay. what it does for folks. Absolutely. So um, the app is a mental health peer support app. It's peer to peer support. It's anonymous and it's free. It's located in the Apple App Store and on Google Play. Um, and it's been it's been long, it's, it's been available since about October of last year. And what White Flag is is a uh, a place for people who are struggling with mental health and addiction issues, or their family members are, or their friends are, or they just want to help other people who are struggling. They go and they they come on the app, and you can either raise your white flag, and then specifically ask for things to receive support for, for like PTSD, anxiety depression, suicidal ideation. Uh, and then, you know, you can also discuss some of the stuff you're using to cope with um, alcohol, Xanax, uh, whatever it may be that you are using to kind of deal with your pain. And then finally, your background issues, whether, you know, you are adopted, whether you, um, you know, you've, you've incurred some, some sort of trauma, you can really uh, raise your white flag and be connected with somebody who's going through the exact same things as you. And uh, upon raising your white flag, the group of people in the app that are already there um, are notified that somebody with issues in common with them is seeking somebody to talk to anonymously. And so what we're seeing happen is once you raise your white flag, multiple people are starting to reach out. Some of them are veterans. Some of them are moms talking with other moms dealing with postpartum depression. You know, we have, you know, people who are going through a divorce, child custody dispute, stuff that you never really think, hey, this person is going to, I think mean, there's a helicopter flying over, but hey, this person is, uh, this, uh, my issues are, are, are my own. I'm not, de no, I, I've never met anybody else who's dealt with them, but white flag changes all of that. White flag shows you that you're truly not alone in exactly what you're dealing with. And so uh, the other aspect of it, besides raising a white flag, is just going on there and uh, perusing through people who have raised their white flag. You can go to their profile, you read their story, their mental health journey. You can go through and see what issues that they want to talk about, whether it be depression, anxiety, um, you know, and, you know, paranoia, bipolar disorder, and you can reach out to somebody who's looking for help. So if you're the person, if you're the type of person who's like, listen, I don't want to ask for help. That's me. I don't want to ask for help, you know, but I tell you what, I get a lot out of helping other people intrinsically. It elevates my consciousness. It, it, you know, when they talk about uh, teachers, who are teaching stuff, you, the, the reason that the, the teacher knows so much is because they continuously talk about it over and over again. And they learn new avenues of what they're trying, of the topic that they're trying to teach you. And so the more that an individual is open to talking about the stuff that we really don't talk about, which is nightmares. You know, I'm, I'm a civil, I was a civil rights attorney before opening the app. 
And I used to wake up with my fingernails broken off in the paint in the walls and because my nightmares were so bad mm -hmm. that I would try to tunnel out of my house and I would wake up with blood on my hands and on the wall. And then I would wash off and I would go to court and, and everybody would be like, what a great, this guy's great, he's doing great. And, uh, you know, we'll get to my story later, but, but the truth of the matter is, is, you know, we're, we're, we're all, we're all struggling. And if I would have met somebody during the, that time period, who would have said for my example about my nightmares, who would have said, yeah, man, listen, you know, I go through the same things. I, I put, you know, items in my way to make sure I can't escape the room. And I finally did meet that. Uh, when I was in treatment for uh, PTSD, I met a veteran who described it and it was the most impactful moment of my life. And we, we've been together ever since. He and I are very close. I went and picked him up when he graduated from the treatment facility. We talk all the time. He actually has my dog. Shout out to my dog. Um, but, you What's know, dog's name? Rhea. Rhea is the, she, that is a, I, I, I'm big into philosophy and Greek mythology. And Rhea was the mother of Zeus. And so I, um, Rhea, uh, she was basically like my support animal. And she lives with him now, you know, because he's alone and, um, you know, he's still in recovery and whatnot. But uh, I miss her every day. But, uh, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's wonderful, you know, for them to, to be together, but back to white flag. And so when you're on the app, you can either give support or get support. And it's that, it's that conversation, that connection with somebody where you just say, are you okay? And they're like, no, not today. Like, you want to talk about it? And, you know, then the conversation turns into, well, not right now, but maybe I, maybe tomorrow I'll check in with me. We have people on the app checking in with each other. We have friends who have found each other and now they talk all the time. Um, and so, you know, white flag is just a, a safe and healthy space for people who are suffering to go uh, and give support to others like they do in support groups or get it themselves. And they don't have to they don't have to post on Facebook. They don't have to make it a cry for help that their friends, and family think, oh, it's, you know, she's just crying for help. Come to us. Come on our app. And you're going to meet real people who are struggling with the exact same thing that you're going through. And when you connect with that person, you know. It's, it's gold that we have inside of us, experiences that, that we've been through and trauma that we've been through and overcome. It, it hardens into gold inside of us. And if we can break it off and give that to somebody else who's in poor mental health, who's in poor health at all, if you give them the gold and the value of your experience through that, I mean, you know, we've really got an opportunity here to impact you know, on, on a grand scale. And so to your listeners, um, you know, if, if you're struggling or if somebody else, you know, is struggling, you know, tell them about white flag app, you know, we're there, uh, 24 hours a day. It's anonymous. You, you don't talk to a white flag team member. You just talk to somebody else who's going through the same things. And so I'm always hoping to improve the app in many ways. And if you've got any feedback, you can find me as well. But, uh, yeah, so white flag has been uh, a blessing. The, the messages that we get, the emails, that we receive on, you know, through our website and just me personally, um, you know, the antidotes, antidotes that I get from people that I actually know, it makes it all worthwhile, you know, and we get caught up in fundraising and you get caught up in growing your startup and adding team members and you forget to check the email. And so I, I, I need to remind my staff to send me the emails more often because um, it is literally the fuel for my fire and my purpose is, is these individuals who are saying, you know, I, I, my wife told me she was suicidal last week. She got downloaded the app and she's talking with another lady that she feels comfortable with. Thank you so much. I didn't know what to do. You know, my son's away in college, his roommate committed suicide. He's on the app talking to other people who witnessed a suicide. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it is, it's, it, it's, it, it's just no words. There's no words. Yeah. And the timing for this coming through the pandemic, we all had our own struggles. And I think the pandemic revealed what it was that we were struggling with. Right. And before that, I think that we were busy enough or successful enough or life was okay enough that we didn't have to look behind the curtains of our own lives or we didn't have to investigate things too much we could just stay busy with stuff and keep going but the pandemic was a revelation if right. you know. it revealed what our weaknesses are what our fears are where we are uncomfortable and where we can't hide anymore so this app coming out now and 
mean, not this moment, it's been in the works for a bit, but the timing of that is really powerful. There's such a need. And I love how you've created community. Community is so powerful. Right. There's so much redemption and hope and encouragement and compassion and kindness to be found in communities. And finding a community that sees you, that hears you, and understands you, golly. Right. First time ever. First time ever, you know, for me to have ever been fully, you know, truly understood was when I, I matched with somebody who could understand what I wasn't able to say. I mean, that's just the, that's just the basic uh, fundamental uh, property that happens when you connect with somebody who's been through the same things as you, you're not able to, uh, you're not able to put into words, you know, like, the, like some of these veterans that I'm close with now, cause I have complex PTSD. It's a little different, but some of these veterans, you know, um, I, I just broke down, you know, I was, I just broke down and I wasn't able to talk and communicate. And then they, you know, the individuals who I'm connecting with, they understood that language. They understood that pain. They understood, oh, I recognize this sorrow. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you what it's like to, to be, be a work, you know, somebody who people consider to be, you know, a master orator and somebody who people believe, you know, think has, can always find the right words. I mean, I've done closing arguments and, you know, I've, you know, set, had cases where, you know, ridiculous amounts of liability on each side and the fact is when somebody says what what's it like what do you mean when you're trying to say i'm suffering crickets yeah it's hard it's yeah it's hard i mean how do you describe how how do you describe something that you've never heard described before that's what it is mm -hmm. and you know i've said this before but I truly believe that we are in the beginning of the mental health revolution. And what I mean by that is, you know, we had, the, you know, we've had an industrial revolution, a civil rights revolution. We had the, uh, the tech revolution that took place in the early 2000s. And if you look at the trends and you look at what's what the more that we're starting to understand the brain and consciousness and mental health, the more people are going, this is, this is, this is everything because, mm -hmm worker productivity is that you know people only care about productivity workers when you're talking about change well imagine if your worker was mentally healthy for 90 percent of the time that they were there instead of 60 or 50 which is the case nowadays imagine all those days that you go to work the people who are listening at home in your cubicle or in an office and you get there and you're you're trying to get to noon so you can go to your lunch break and then you're trying to get to five well imagine if you were healthy how much better it would be, you know, your quality of time at your employer's office or even for your employer to see, you know, customer service going up, accounts going up. The reality the situation is until people understand that when we go in and we affect change with people's mental, mental health, everything change. We're going to bring up everything. We're going to bring up productivity. We're going to bring up consciousness, tolerability, empathy. Crime is going to go down. Crime is going to go down significantly. And what, you know, once you understand, well, that guy right there is struggling, hurting people, hurt people, Melissa, yes, hurting people, do. hurt people. And this guy over here is screaming. He's causing a scene at McDonald's. You know, maybe the guy over here who normally would punch him in the face will understand this guy over here. He may have just lost his mom. Mm -hmm. This guy over here, this is not. I'm better than you behavior. This is, I'm suffering and I don't know how to describe it behavior. Mm -hmm. And if, if we start, you know, I mean, if we could, if we could just start chipping away at this, what a harmonious place this would be. Uh, you know, spirituality is one way to do it, but it's got to be full circle on the brain and mental health and everything's got, we've got to work together to uh, illuminate what could actually happen if somebody is given the opportunity of, of good mental health and I am what can happen. You know, my story is what can happen where you are at the top of your game in another profession, respected profession, whatever, as an attorney. And once I got healthy, I was like, I got, 
I've got too much in me. I've got too many ideas of ways that I can pull other people out that are still down there in that place that I was in. But I, I, I wouldn't be here. We have, you know, 15 employees. We're on the way. I'm just speaking from, you know, a society standpoint. Helping people heal is good for the planet. It's good for society. It's good for humanity. It's good for your family. I know that you don't, and I'm speaking to your users at home. I know that people don't realize it, but one in four people are suffering. So if yeah. there's four of y'all at the dinner table, one of y'all is not telling the truth. And that number sounds low to me. It's low. It's low, but it's still shocking that, you know, that that's one out of every four. And if you go into professions, it's even scarier. You know, police is one out of every three have PTSD. Well, so if there's nurses two right now. Oh, nurses is hmm. I mean, bless bless the heart. You know, I, I, I got I had COVID and I actually had to go to the hospital because I had Crohn's disease on top of everything else. And to, and to for me, it was a horrific experience having to go to a hospital where there's a bunch of people sick and a pandemic. It's very scary. I can't imagine what, you know, not just through the pandemic, but, you know, through being a nurse uh, on, on a daily basis, dealing with mental, mentally ill people who, again, like me, uh, like I used to be, lash out. They don't know how to communicate. So it's just this mess. And they're on the front lines. The nurses are there, we have a lot of nurses on our app, a lot of nurses on our app. Yeah. Well, there is a pivotal case, criminal case, that has changed everything for nurses, but that will take us off in a different direction. Next time. We'll, we'll dig, dig into that next time. I would love to. So, Johnny, well, before we go any further, I want to be very clear. White Flag app, available on the App Store, available on Google Play. It's online. You can go to whiteflagapp.com and it's there on your desktop or laptop as well, but make sure you check that out. If you don't feel like you need the support there, maybe you're the perfect support person for someone else. Right. So make sure you download that app. But uh, I would love to hear more of your story if you would like to share it. Yeah, absolutely. Um... I'll finish my plug. Uh, so, um, yeah, if you guys like the app, write us a review. That reviews they reach people that you wouldn't imagine, and we could really use that. We could really use the, you know, the positivity because people say, "Are they using it?" And we're like, "Yeah, we've got the analytics." And they, they love, you know, the feedback, and that's how we can continue to to provide the app and grow. As if we, as if we know, and our, you know, our people around us know that you're enjoying it. So please do. Um, but yeah, I, uh, you know, I built the app, um, white flag app through, uh, in my own experience. And when I was struggling, and this is a preface and I'll get to my story, but when I was struggling, I would go through, um, every viable resource that I had to, at my disposal. And I was an attorney. I had great, excuse me, great insurance. I had great connections. And um, I spent about, uh, I think it was about 16 months writing emails to insurance companies, begging them, telling them, I'm going to commit suicide tonight. I need to get into a treatment place for 18 months. And that's still the hardest part is going back and reading those emails. Mm -hmm. But what I, what I was also doing was I was researching through apps and looking for, I just wanted to hear somebody say, I know how much pain you're in and you haven't surpassed the moment where human beings should take their own life. You still have more to go. That's what I wanted. I, Cause I was in so much pain. I mean, I was sleeping in the woods across the street from my house. You know, I was um, overusing medication. I was sleeping until 4 PM in the day. And, you know, I, I, I still couldn't find a way where I, where I thought that, um, that I, I would be comfortable talking about this stuff and, and, and couldn't find it, couldn't find an app, couldn't find a solution, couldn't find a peer support. So I drew on a little piece of paper and it just had a list of names and next to the names was everything that the person could be going through. So, you know, it said Mark, PTSD, anxiety, Teresa, you know, bulimia, anorexia, nervosa, binge eating, uh, and, and just had this list. And, um, and uh, that I went back and, and looked at that list after I got out of my own treatment. And that was what kind of started the product design. But my story starts, um, 
you know, long before I was born and anybody who is, who has struggled with mental health issues and you don't know the cause as in, I don't know if my daughter has any trauma. I don't know if my son has trauma. I don't know, you know, textbook generational trauma being passed down is what, is what I'm about to talk about. So before I was born in the 1950s, my father lived in a rural, rural area of South Carolina. You think I'm country. My father was, he's very country. And um, he was, he worked on peach farms, tobacco farms, corn in the corn mill uh, in a little teeny town called Mackby, South Carolina, less than 800 people, 30 people in his graduating class. And back in those days, uh, the houses were very, very far apart. A lot of people grew grass and wheat and all the other stuff on their land. And my, my parents didn't have, you know, my, my grand, my father didn't have a very wealthy upbringing. His dad was a mail carrier, very respected person, but, you know, um, and so my father, um, uh, he was used to this, you know, kind of country style life and, and, and entails in that is, you know, houses that are way out in the middle of nowhere. And in, in one of those houses was my great grandfather's house and my great grandfather, uh, my father, uh, my great grandfather, um, he he got a divorce from his first wife, moved from where he was in a big city back into his little teeny farmhouse in the middle of nowhere in Mackby. And my dad, who was, who would have been his, uh, my, my, my dad, who was his grandchild, uh, used to visit this man and, uh, his brothers, uh, the, the man's brothers would, would as well. My, my father's, you know, uncles and, and, and whatnot. And, uh, the reason they would visit him is because he, they called him very sad. He was heartbroken. So they would take turns staying with him and, and live, you know, spend the night and then they would pass off to the next guy. And it was my dad's night. Uh, and he got dropped off in front of that long, long road, dirt road. And he walks all the way down and finally gets to the house and there's no electricity and there's no phones, but there's always candles and fires burning. And there wasn't any that day. And it was almost dark out. So my dad, you know, he was like, well, you know, he's not he, we know he didn't go anywhere um so he starts to look around the house and you know he sees that there's a that there's no fire burning and um he went to the room where he was to stay with my great-grandfather and laying in the bed uh fully dressed with a, a note in his left hand and a gun in his right hand he had he had put put it in his mouth and taken his own life and my dad was 12 years old and um mm. he didn't know what to do he didn't know where to go or, you know, there's nowhere to call. Or so my dad, he didn't know if he was going to wake up, didn't know if a ghost was going to pop out, didn't know. And uh, so he laid at the um, sort of at the foot of the bed, sat, sat right outside the door um, and kept going back in between the room for 12 hours. Oh my um, and the thoughts of why would he do this? How, he, he had to have known I was coming over. He knew I was coming over. Is the note for me? Should I open the note? What will happen if I look in the note? Yeah. Um, so my dad leaves the house the next morning. You can imagine the sun coming up and him str strolling out, you know, onto the, the dirt road. And he walks, you know, however far he had to walk to get to the bus stop and gets on the bus, goes to school, goes through school, goes all the way through football practice, comes home, tells my sweet little grandmother, what happened and she looks at him and says whatever you do don't tell anybody especially your father mm. and that was the last time my dad spoke of it and uh you know at the funeral they never discussed it and you know it was just a death um you know and so that's the way that it was told and years later my father without ever healing without ever talking about it without ever discussing it, he marries my mother and my mom comes uh, from a very mentally ill background as well, um, alcoholic father and mother, abuse throughout the home. Um, my mom struggled, you know, she still struggles to talk about it. Um, eight, uh, seven brothers and sisters, uh, and she was one of the youngest. And after her dad died at a very young age, she helped raise some of her younger siblings. Uh, and her, her and my father met. And my dad, you know, he had the collared shirts on and, you know, he's an executive and you can, you, the seventies the wife was, you know, this was, this was my mom and dad, including the, the abuse and beatings, especially the abuse and beating. And, um, you know, she had nothing and nobody to go call or go to. And, uh, I don't have, I, you know, we were never close with any aunts, uncles, cousins, or grandparents. 
I don't have any of their phone numbers, not one of them. And in those days, she would not have had any or very little support. Right. She couldn't have opened a checking account to support herself. She couldn't have rented an apartment or anything else. Those things just simply didn't exist. As, as soon as the boys were born, it was over. Mm -hmm. Because I think in the beginning, it was sort of like, okay, she could still you know, leave and get a new man. But the reality of the situation is once the boys were there, the anchor was there because she knew, you know, it's, it's the 70s, 80s vibe. It's I will never leave my husband. I want to stay together for the children, which is the worst, you know, I mean, from my standpoint and my wife's standpoint, you know, staying together for the children almost cost both of us our lives. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I used to I used to come down and, on the staircase and I, would, I, I always wanted to know. I always wanted to hear the abuse. I always wanted to hear her call her worthless and then B word or the P word or the C word. I needed to know what she was going through. I was the middle child and I was her protector, mm -hmm. I thought. But really what I was doing is I was triggering myself over and over again because we didn't know it. We called it a nervous stomach, but I was born with generalized anxiety disorder. I started having panic attacks when I was five and six years old. Mm -hmm. So imagine a five or six year old right? That they just call nervous, the, you know, the nervous one. And I was an athlete, so I didn't get picked on, you know, for like being scared in the corner. But when your father tells you at night, you're going to burn in the lake of fire, you believe it when you have anxiety and you're six. And when he tells you that, you know, his sins are your sins, mm -hmm. that you, you become so scared mm -hmm. of life and reality that the only people you'll listen to are these toxic individuals, this guy, you know, like this, this is the only guy I think who can, who can, you know, beat the demons away that are coming for me and that are already here. And by the time I had reached 10 years old, um, you know, the abuse had gotten so bad that my father had thrown a butcher knife at my mother and it went right in front of her and landed right over the stove. Mm -hmm. So that was his spot. He would throw, from the we had a table here and he would throw stuff at her and i remember one time there was a police officer who came to our house small town this was in orlando florida and i pointed it out and i said this is where my father threw a knife and i remember and my mom you know she she would tell the story we all laughed they all laughed i guess i mean you know kids are i was like this is where look at this hole this is where my dad threw a butcher i mean it's a big butcher knife so uh it was that same setup that changed my life forever. The dad here at the table throwing stuff at mom here cooking. And, you know, um, as, as, as it happened, I thought it was no big deal. And then as I started to grow and become an 18 year old, you know, in the South, it still was no big deal what I had gone through. And then eventually I learned that what I went through was horrific because I was, I am allowed to say that even though my dad, my brother, and my mom, well, not my mom, but my dad and my brother, you know, initially, he just hit her in the, he just hit her with a bottle. Mm. He just hit her with a bottle. So mom, on this fateful day, I mean, that that's kind of, you know, what I heard. I was 10 years old, and the three boys were all athletes, and we all played sports, and that was our big thing. We had baseball, football, basketball, year round. This was baseball season, and my father was like the father off varsity blues. Most controlling fathers in the South, they, they control you over your athletics. It's the, the, that's their way to relive things. It's very, very true. I know I'm not, mm -hmm. not in that age group, but I grew up in a house where if you did not have a good game, you know, you were shamed and you were threatened that you weren't going to eat that night. So, and that's just the way it was. And I don't even consider that to be abuse, you know, compared to the other stuff. But on this day, I had been given permission to miss baseball practice by my mother because my friend, uh, it, it was some sort of day where he was at another school and, and this was our only day that we were going to get to spend together. So my mom gave the okay to miss baseball practice. And we went, we used to get like a dollar or $2. We'd go buy a Snickers bar from a little convenience store on the dirt road and come back. So we're coming back down the dirt road in Orlando, Florida, it's Pine Street. Pine Street was the name of the street. And there's Pine Tree. Oh, I mean, it's beautiful. And I remember how thick the dirt was or the, 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 the sand was, the, the dirt road sand. And I'm pushing my bike through it. My buddy and I are kind of talking. We got our little bags. You know, you're just kids. 
And I tell, we turned the corner to go down our road. There's only like less than a dozen houses on our road. My house was there, the second one on the left. And, you know, that was the first time I'd ever seen anybody being arrested. And um, they were placing my father in the back of a police car, you know, in between us and the house. He had, he had already been escorted out. And um, he looked he looked at me and my, my best friend, uh, as my father was in handcuffs without shoes on. And the only thing that he could muster to say to me was make sure your mother calls my attorney. Hmm. That was the first time I ever heard that word too, you know, attorney. And, um, and how old were you again? 10? I, I was 10. I was 10. Yes, ma'am. Hmm. And so uh, at that point, you know, you, it doesn't register what's going on. So I was just worried that my friend was going to have to go home. You know, like, I'm like, what, you know, I didn't understand what was going on until I got inside and my mom had a huge, you know, she had stuff all over her, her eye. She had an ice pack and, you know, this bandages and there was police officers and uh, ambulance were EMTs in the house and they're chasing her around and she's just screaming, like, do not take him to jail. Whatever you do, please don't take him to jail. And I just remember them saying he has to go to jail and her taking the ice pack and slamming it on the ground and cussing. And that was when I saw her eye and her nose. And I was just like, I just remember thinking, well, if he's gone and she's shook up like this, who's got me? Yeah. yeah. And, and you know, um, it was tough. Uh, a, a girl who the same girl who told me to paint myself black when I started hanging out with kids on my football team who were African-American. She brought a newspaper cutout of the arrest to school. I was in seventh grade or sixth grade and handed it out. Mm. I just remember like the news cameras got involved because my dad was involved in some other stuff. And because he was president of the little league, it was very public. And uh, we had to move, of course, but we moved states. I was 12 years old. We moved, you know, from everything we knew and loved and felt comfortable with into a little teeny bedroom. We're all on top of each other. We're all mentally ill. All of us are mentally ill to this day. And every fragile foundation you clung to had been taken. Right. And then, and then it gets worse because once we moved, my mom saw the toll that it had on my older brother and my younger brother, because they had social issues and I didn't. So I, I met the quarterback on the first day, shout out to Robbie and Robbie introduced me to all these friends. And I, I'm so grateful for that, but that didn't happen for my brothers and it didn't happen for my mom because she started drinking. Mm -hmm. And once she started drinking and started using medications, Xanax pills, otherwise I had lost my only ally for sure. And as I fought to bring her back, I did the only thing that I knew that I could do, which was show my dad who now had been through all this, you know, uh, court ordered anger management to where he knows now I can't hit these people anymore. But the verbal abuse was just onslaught still worthless is the word I can't, I can't, if you, if somebody calls me worthless in front of me, mm. it's a big issue. It's a big mm. problem. Um, and that's what I just can't imagine calling somebody you love worthless. It's the worst thing that you, cause if they believe it, you know, mm -hmm. so my mom starts drinking white wine with Chablis heavily. She always drank it. Cause I remember in Florida before the move, can I get a little glass of ice with my Chablis? I used to always make mom can I get a little glass of ice with my Chablis. So by the time we got to Myrtle beach after the move, you know, she was drinking over a gallon of Chablis a day. And, uh, you know, again, battered housewife at home and it progressively got worse. And my older brother was, uh, my older brother's got a lot going on with himself. So let's just say that he was apathetic to the situation. Then he goes off to college. So now it's me. I got this, this guy, this dad figure here, you know, it, as far as like love and protection and all that good stuff, you know, that just like, he wasn't somebody who would step in and say, Hey, I know that your mom is, you know, dying in front of your eyes, but I'm here for you. That never occurred. And, um, you know, it got to the point where I would say, dad, she's drinking, dad, she's drunk. And then my mom would say, 
oh, well, he called me a B-I-T-C-H. And my dad would turn to me and come at me because that's all I cared about. That's all I need. And I'm, I'm 15 years old. I'm not calling this woman cuss word. I'm trying to bring the attention. So eventually I went into the garbage and I started pulling out. I said, dad, how long has the garbage been? He said, oh, it's been, oh, it just goes out tomorrow. I go, full week? Yeah, full week. So I pulled them out. One bottle, two bottle, three bottles. Then I went all her hiding spots, her trunk, the washing machine, everywhere. And I pulled out 11 bottles of Chablis wine, of Chablis wine that had been drank, a gallon, you know, the, with a little handle mm-hmm. in seven days. And, and um, we finally sent her off to rehab the next day or a couple of days later, however long it took, only because I threatened to call the police on my dad um and and you're 15 and i'm 15 yeah and my older brother's gone it's just me so they take mom away to rehab she goes to cottonwood arizona and i had pretty much you know given up i was like all right this lady's she's out she's going to be alive you know she would be covered in feces like i'd have i couldn't have friends over i was you know popular guy and if she would come out of the room she had all these skin issues from the alcohol. Her hair was falling out. I mean, this woman was beautiful. She was my angel growing up. She, you know, every night it was just mom and I. And um, so I had pretty much given up. But but then her therapist started reaching out to me and asking me, you know, hey, you know, she really wants to repair this relate. None of the other ones. That, you know, she really. So I started asking for recipes for the dinners that she used to make, so I could cook to my little brother. You know, kind of give him a little sim, you know, symbolism of family or togetherness or whatever and you know I, I, I went off to college uh, my mom got out of rehab you know she she went and got a little job as a hotel front desk clerk you know how they do in recovery and uh, eventually I started seeing you know I zero 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 in my bank account always and eventually I started seeing like 250 a hundred dollars and I, I, I called her I said what is this and it was she was getting her checks direct deposited in my bank account and she knew that I was struggling in college. I mean, we didn't have any money. Like my, my dad, I, you know, I was on the Pell Grant, which is for people who are below the poverty line. Um, and so we, we began to, to patch up our relationship. And when I got into law school, you know, they were very, very, my mom and dad were both very proud of me. And I thought that I was going to move on with my life. And then on uh, October 17th, 2009, another horrific trauma happened to me worse than the other stuff I described. I, I was practicing corporate law in downtown Columbia, South Carolina, big job, thought I was a big wig, you know, first person in my family to become anything really. Uh, my older brother ended up going to law school after I did, which was the purpose of me going. I wanted to open up opportunities for my family that weren't there for me. And, uh, after I got out of law school, I had this good job, corporate downtown, but I, I, I got diagnosed with Crohn's disease several years earlier via surgery. So my drinking wasn't, you know, on par with what it would have been for a, a guy fresh out of law school at that point. And on this fateful night, there was a wedding in town the next day. So this night was a rehearsal dinner and all my friends are coming into town and they're staying with me from out of town. Um, and they're going to the rehearsal. Some of them are going to the rehearsal dinner. And one of the individuals is, uh, I went to, picked up after he told me, Hey, it's over with Come get me from downtown. And, um, as I got down there, he was, um, standing outside of the restaurant, the bar where he had been earlier. Um, and I, you know, kind of, uh, bigger group was inside as well. Um, so I kind of went inside and by the time I'd come back outside to check on him, he was on the ground and three police officers were on top of him. Well, attorneys hang out with attorneys. This guy was a prosecutor. And he was a prosecutor for a very, very famous prosecutor in our state, Strom Thurmond Jr. And I've heard that name. Yeah, yeah, I bet you have. And so I, I, I wait till they lift him up. He's writhing in pain. His, his hand was flapping behind his head. So when they put him on the ground, imagine your hand in here. And I was worried, but I didn't do anything aggressive. I wait till they stand him up. And I said, listen, you know, why don't you guys just release him to my custody? I'll make sure he gets home. No problem. I didn't know what happened. They say, they pushed me away and said, who are you? Back up. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. All right. If you guys are really taking him to jail, just tell me, are you taking him to Alvin Glenn? Are you taking him down the city so I can pick him up, take him to a wedding? Well, who, who you know, back up, who are you? And I, okay, well, I'm an attorney. I know it because they were what, confused. How do you know about the two different jail systems? Mm-hmm. So I'm an attorney. And as soon as I said I was an attorney, they, they left off of him. One guy stayed on him and they came at me and they, flipped me around and they put me in handcuffs and they walked us over to the cop car. And I kept saying, wait, 
what am I going to jail for? You don't have to tell me what, what am I going to jail for? And he kept saying the officer on the, the supervisor kept saying for that right there for asking questions. And I was, and I, I said, listen, this is the only thing I learned was that you can question government, you can question law enforcement. And it turned out that Kip was being arrested for trespassing, which was, you know, 80, 80 feet away from the front of the built from the front entrance of the building. And I had been arrested for interfering with an arrest. But what happened was when they took us down to the jail that night, I remember thinking to myself, all of the times that my dad described his jail experience to his 10 year old son. See, when my dad got home from jail, he sat me down and told me all about the lights and the screaming and the drug addicts and the violence and the abuse. And this is, this is Goliath telling me this stuff. And I, years old. and then it, and then it, then it was, that was when their programs became, became prevalent in schools, you know, dare drug awareness, resistance, education, shout out to dare in the eighties. And so, Every month we're being told these are the things you can go to jail for you jail, jail, jail. And I was, I was so afraid of committing a crime that mm. the only way that I could regulate that was to just stay away from anything altogether. So I'd never smoked weed. I'd never done any drugs or anything like that. So by the time we're, we get to the jail that night, I am in full anxiety breakdown uh, and they put us in this little room when we get there and they come one by one and there's eight of us in there total. And we come one by one and ask each person, what, you know, uh, uh, what do you do for a living? We need to put you on bond paperwork. So we're listening to all these other guys and they, they tell out your charges, murder, attempted murder, burglary guys standing next to me, uh, had just, had just attempted to kill his girlfriend. Hmm. Then my friend, and then another guy with a DUI, only two of us in there for, you know, trespassing interference. One by one, they let all these folks out to bond hearing. One by one, until there was three left. Me, my friend, and the guy who was in there for attempting to kill his, his girlfriend. For us, they walk us, they walk us uh, up to the door, our orange jumpsuits, and they tell us, you need to go change. You're being shifted to general population. What? And I remember, I, I remember at that moment, like it happened so fast and, that, and and they put us in this little shower area and it was me and my buddy and the other guy, they weren't even worried about changing because he was covered in blood. It was me and my buddy. And I re I just remember thinking we're, we're going to have to stick together in here. Like what what's going to happen? And I remember him who was a prosecutor and dealt with the situation looking so afraid, so afraid. And I, and that was when I, I remember thinking to myself, Whatever happens, whatever happens, it's not as bad as your dad says. It's not as bad. It's not going to be that way. You're not going to stay overnight. Boy, was I wrong. So they come and they get us. Kips, the, uh, the, the, the correctional officer comes and gets me and the other guy. And he's walking us down. And there's a big door at the end of the hallway. And this guy, this huge, huge guy, turns to both of us because we were shaking. And he goes, do not let them see you scared. And then he opens the door and all 86 inmates were eating lunch, all of them. And I'm thinking, well, this is worse for you because we, we did not, we were not well versed in what to do, where to stand, what, you know, and we were immediately picked on, you know, commotion in our room. And so they moved our room down to be a little bit closer to the desk so they could watch us. And then after dinner that night, um, as we're walking back to our cells, I hear one of the guards screaming and running. And by the time I turn around, they, they open the door and the guy's hanging there. And so I, I witnessed a, an inmate take his own life. On and I just, of trauma on top, after trauma on top of it, right. And I just remember, like, you imagine what it looks like when a bomb goes off. And the first thing that you think about is like the colors change. And that's what I like as soon as that, that as soon as the noise started, because the officer went in shock, a trained officer fell to the ground right in front of the front of the jail cell. So another guy. So now I'm just like face to face looking at this guy who had been who hung himself. And it was obvious that he was dead. He had his tongue out and his eyes were popping out of his head. 
And this guy comes running down uh, from the entranceway. I mean, this was like three minutes. So you can imagine if something happened to one of us. Runs mm-hmm. down from the entranceway. And he's yelling at his mic, suicide code, whatever. And by the time he gets down there, he cuts the guy down. And when he rolls him over, I, that, that's the memory that I have. And when he rolls mm-hmm. him over, because that's when I got the best look at like everything. Yeah. And, you know, people are like, well, why didn't you look away? Are you serious? I was in a jail. I was in jail. I didn't like you look where the commotion's happening as a as a trauma response to process it, but also protect yourself like are they going to come is this you know is this a threat that's coming to me so eventually you know they put us in our cells they made sure we were locked in there and a judge came down uh after she had gotten word that you know these guys were in the jail who witnessed the suicide and the guy was still on the floor when they took us to our bond hearing at midnight it was a crime scene so i'm in there like my dad with my grandfather with a dead body near me for you know five six hours seven hours before they took us in the bond here and just let us out but it was the trapped the inability to move to get away from danger that put me into a permanent state of of fight flight or freeze and i was in a permanent state when i left that jail and i was diagnosed with ptsd anxiety depression trauma and given my first benzodiazepine two days after i got out of the jail a week into me getting out of the jail, I started seeing cop cars coming around my house. I started hearing from friends, oh, my buddy's you know, dating this police officer. And, you know, they're talking about coming to get you for something real because they heard that they got you for something that wasn't real and that there's a lawsuit. So they're going to try to find something on you. And so, I mean, I just broke. Mm-hmm. And I told this guy who I was living with, I got to get out of here, man. I, you know, I think I'm going to kill myself. I think I'm going to take my life if I don't get out of here. And um, the only place I had to go was back home where all of these dark memories were. And where this, this idiot dad of mine who still hasn't come to grips with how toxic he is with his, with what he says and does and how he talks to people. So I go to get my hair cut at a hair salon, the same one that you always go to, you know, we all got to, I, I just want, and when I moved home three hours away, two and a half hours, I wanted, I just wanted to, to make sure that I had gotten a haircut, got a couple of my stuff out of Columbia, so I'd never had to come back. And I didn't return for four years. And the reason I didn't return is because when I went to get my haircut, the young lady cutting my hair told me, hey, there's a surveillance video of your arrest. And that's when everything changed. She told me with tears in her eyes. So I ran to my old law firm who I was still working with at the time. I got a USB and I typed up a spoilation of evidence letter and I called the owner of the bar and I called his attorney and they met me there the next day. And it looked like Steven Spielberg had set up cameras in this little rinky dink bar. And at that moment, and I watched and I, and I, because the officers had to claim that I physically touched them or it's, you know, now they're learning the law later. So they put in there, grabbed an officer by the arm. And I didn't get that news until a couple of days later. And so when I got the video, and it showed that I didn't touch anybody, that, that the guy I got arrested with was standing on a wall, 80 feet away, texting with his head down. They assaulted both of us. We didn't do anything. The video goes viral because we attached it to the lawsuit. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that's when they, I thought that they had, they'll admit what they did. They'll give me my peace of mind back. They'll give me my soul back because that was taken from me. And they didn't they didn't they pushed the, the pedal down even further and they said you know what there's less than one tenth of a second where you're not where your hands are not seen i guess because I, I turned like that and my hands are up the whole time and we think that that's that's the time that you went down and touched mm-hmm. her on i swear to god that that is what they claim and they said if you don't drop your lawsuit we're going to elevate it to assault and battery on a police officer and put you back in the same jail cell mm-hmm. I went through that for four years, four years. They, they, they deposed my ex-girlfriend and asked her how many times we had sex after I came out of the jail, as if to say, if the guy's got mental illness, you know, why are you guys having fun in the bedroom? She was married with two kids at the time of the deposition. They deposed my mother and said, don't you think your son was drunk that night because you were an alcoholic and ruined his life? Mm-hmm. They deposed my father and said, don't you think he grabbed that female because you used to beat your wife? And, and he's a wife beater now too. They deposed my older brother, my young, everybody. 
And then after I got done with that lawsuit, I won. They changed the law. Um, and, you know, it's forever be known as McCoy versus City of Columbia stands for you cannot arrest me for asking a question. It meant a lot to me. It meant a lot to me. But the damage had been done. I had I had suffered severely for those four years. I had been diagnosed with peripheral neuropathy from pain in my legs, Botox injections for pain in my head. My eyes were twitching so much they were closed the majority of the time when I would try to focus on things. The anxiety was so bad that, I mean, I was, you know, I was 60 pounds less than I am now. And I would continuously wait for them to come get me at the door. Wait. I was just waiting for them to come kick the door in and get me. And then eventually we won my case and I took the money and I put it all into doing a criminal defense practice. Now, this was not something I ever imagined I wanted to do. But I knew that if they were doing this to me and uh, what were they doing to people who don't have a law degree? What are they doing to people who you know, don't have access to this kind of defense. And so I, I started getting triggered every time a new case would come in. They'd pull somebody over for a tag light violation. They'd search for nine and a half hours, you know, find a pill in the back of a, you know, a six-year-old woman's purse and they'd take her to jail for controlled substance. And I just couldn't deal with that properly, but I was making money and I knew I had to, to cope. I knew I needed the alcohol. I knew I needed the traveling and, you know, the wild party because I was in full blown PTSD, full blown every day, all night. And it got to the point where I would get a case in and I would read the facts of the case. And the first part would be the police executed a search warrant at 5 a.m. They kicked the door down, they breached, they got inside. What do you think I dreamed about that night? Mm. So eventually I started sleeping in the woods across the street from my house. I'd get really drunk and I would you know, go over there and I would just sit and I would wait for them to come and then I would go inside, I would shower, I'd clean off, and I'd go to court, and I'd win, and then I'd come home, and I'd collapse, so eventually, I I would travel around the, the, the state and the country to get away from these police, uh, these people who I thought were coming to get me, and I learned that traveling out of the country was very therapeutic for me, it was like I could, you know, rest, now I'm sick, I'm not saying that anybody should be afraid of cops like this, I'm sick, and when I would set down, so I decided as, as I started planning my suicide, as I started like walking through, like how many pills are you going to have to take? Should you do it outside? So, you know, I, I, I took it upon myself to leave the country and try to connect spiritually with a higher power. Because after you've gone through all I went through, I mean, I was in denial of God and the universe, atheist. I mean, you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And... I go and I climb Machu Picchu with a buddy of mine down in Peru and I got up to the top and there's no ropes. And I'm thinking, why, how in the world these people not slip off the same? But I remember thinking this, this is your, this is your chance, bro. Either right now or make an agreement. And I, and I looked up, I mean, you're in the clouds, it's overwhelming. And I just said, I just need a break, just one break. And that, and uh, the next day we we flew to Brazil, and the following night I met my wife teaching samba uh, on her birthday in a veranda on, in Rio. And she is, I mean, I'm only alive because of her. She's the only reason that she's all my reason. She's, but she struggles too, you know. And and on our first date, the first time, you know, I got her to go to dinner with me the first time. Um, and her dad was being released from a involuntarily committed facility where they treated you for drug, alcohol, abuse, and other symptoms. That was, she got interrupted in our in our dinner, our first dinner, and said, "I'm really sorry, I have to take this call." First of all, the girls I'm used to would have just picked it up and walk away. So I'm really sorry, I need to take this call. And she takes it in Portuguese. And she puts it down and I, you know, I said, you don't have to tell me what it was about. She tells me what it was about. And I tell her what I'm about. And that was it. That was it. I knew that I would never be apart from her ever again. And then I went home. I meet, I mean, we only known each other for four days. I went home and I immediately applied for a tourist visa and it got denied because she was so poor. Then I called two legislators, Lindsey Graham and Tom Rice, who are my legislators and senators. They sent letters, they called, they did everything. The response they got back was, 
her family makes less than $2,000 a year, seven people in a two bedroom house. Why would she ever go back? We don't allow people to visit here who have no reason to go back. And she had just, her, her nephew had just been born, her family, her grandma, everything. And she's going, cause now she's from a totally different culture. She didn't live in Rio. She lived in central, central Brazil. And now she's going, well, what do I, you know, uh, I don't have anything. So they're right. Like I, I I'm going to come back though, because it's my family and that in the, in their culture, that's all the reason you need. She's going, why, why are they all let me come? I'm done. So I started having to, so you can imagine how my mental health went. This is the key to me being able, and this was the only time I felt like I was okay. So I started flying her over to the Bahamas because our own country wouldn't let her lay over. So I started flying her. This poor girl has never left her country, never been on a plane flying her all the way in the Bahamas and I fly my brother over to meet her. And, you know, it was a really tough time. And then eventually we got approved a year later on a fiance visa. We got married on May 5th, 2018. And I, I took a bunch of sleeping medicine on in July and I tried to go to sleep forever. And I, I just been, I'd been awake for several days and I guess I knew that when I woke up, she was going to take care of me. She was going to tell me, you know, what to do and where to go. Cause I didn't have anybody, you know, I'm everybody's hero. Like who tells me what to do? And I enrolled in a trauma treatment facility in Ocala, Florida called the refuge. When I got there, I had, I had uh, upped my dosage of Xanax to six milligrams um, with my therapist and if, or with my doctor, my treat, my treating physician. And if the, your users are listening, if you guys take one, you'll be asleep for 12 hours. And I was practicing law at a high level, but this is very dangerous medication. Very, very dangerous. It's, it's impossible to get off of that much without getting, getting help in a treatment facility. And so I did, but I was supposed to, I was supposed to come off over the course of 18 months. And I promised my wife, I left on January 20th. And I said, by August 20th, I'll be off of the Xanax so that you can come for family week. And I just went to the to the doc, to the doctor there on on the campus of the treatment facility I went to. And I said, "Is it possible for me to come off the Xanax in, in 30 days?" And he lied and said it was, and he he switched me to Valium. And I just went home that night. I was on 60 milligrams of Valium, and I just wrote at the bottom of my journal, 60, 55, 50, 40, 45, you know, all the way down to zero. And by the time my wife got there, I was nonverbal. Um, I was horrific i had gone through horrific withdrawals i had ripped an organ that needed to be repaired surgically i laid in the bathtub for so long uh having the water run over me that my skin got raw and i was you know bleeding from everywhere the withdrawals from what i went through were something that i mean i knew that they were going to be bad but um i remember just thinking let it let let this take me i know i'm suicidal already just let this finish it finish me off please. So that, so that my wife doesn't have to you know, be a widow because I took my own life. And the, the craziest part about all of this is, and the reason I tell this whole story, when I enrolled for treatment, they asked me, do you have a history of mental illness in your family? And I didn't know because my father never told me what he went through. Mm. So, so this guy saw me dying because I witnessed a suicide and was around a dead body. He saw this from 2009 until he finally told me his story in 2021 last year. Mm. I almost died not knowing that my father and I had a similar experience. And now, you know, it made us a lot closer. But the reason that I tell my story is you may not think that what you went through is that bad. But if your kids are hurting, if your loved ones are hurting, your family members are hurting, it was. I get all that I just told y'all, I didn't even think was bad until after I got out of treatment. I never thought any of this was a story. None of it. I just thought this was the way life was. And so when I got out of my treatment facility and I learned about that peer support, by the way, my wife came down and we had a wonderful, well, not a wonderful, I was nonverbal and drooling and shaking, but she learned about my disease. She learned about PTSD and Xanax addiction and she absorbed it and you know 
we fight for each other because I, you know, I, I fight for her mental health like she does mine. And the important thing is after I got out of the trauma treatment facility, I understood the value of peer to peer support of somebody understanding you. I mean, I only met with my therapist. It was, you know, it's 30 grand to go to this place. I only met with my therapist once a week. That means the rest of the time, I'm just talking to other people who are going through the same things as me. They put you in groups according to your background. So when I got home to Myrtle Beach, I looked for groups and guess what? There were none. There were no trauma groups. There were no anxiety groups. There's nobody talking about anxiety, which is which was my big thing. And so I created them. I created the areas first. We started off with two people in a garage. Um, and uh, we eventually were able to get a loading dock. We had you know 10 people in a loading dock. And eventually, a state uh, representative got us a big meeting room in the YMCA. We went from two members to 60 in person every month. And over a thousand people online just watching, you know, getting memes and inspirational quotes and whatever. And then, like you said, COVID hit. And I, mo I moved everybody from all of this stuff, all of this other things I got going on with the groups. And, the, and I moved them all into a group chat. And I watched as they just, they helped each other throughout the day and throughout the night. And I, I would silence the chat at night, but they would just keep right on talking all the way through the night. And you would see, it'd only be like five or six of them, but you would see all the little heads go down. So everybody's reading it, everybody's learning, everybody's, everybody's you know, getting something out of participating in watching or, uh, or learning about somebody else's mental health issue. So I immediately, after COVID happened, I immediately um, created a nonprofit called the Ori County Citizens Crisis Response. Um, that was Can to pair people who are struggling Oh, sorry, the Horry County Citizens Crisis Response. We closed it after the COVID was over, which is, you know, the right and ethical thing to do, I think. And so uh, I, I found a way to match people who were looking for stuff with people who needed stuff, whether it be diaper formula, whether it be whatever. And I learned that even if the people were like, hey, I need diaper formula, and everybody, everybody in the comments was like, this lady asked for it yesterday. She's just trying to sell it. And, you know, she's just trying to get money from it. I learned that people would, would say, it doesn't matter it, what she does with the, with the support. It doesn't matter. I'm here because I want to help a problem. And if I get duped or whatever, that's all her. That's her bad energy, her karma. I'm here. And once I saw that, I, 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 I hired an executive director for, the, for that nonprofit. And I immediately went into building a white flag based off of my experience, what I'd seen in my trauma treatment facility in my life. And I created an app that I would use. I created an app that everybody would use. There's no hearts, there's no likes, there's no patronizing comments of walking on the beach, just breathe deep. There's none of that stuff. White flag's a place where you go where you want to have a real conversation. That's it. I'm speechless. I mean, I have no words. Just the sheer breadth of your experience is it's just overwhelming. It's just overwhelming that one person would experience that. But what I want to draw attention to is you're telling the story from the other side of this, that there's hope that while we're telling our stories from the thick of it or from the pit, there are other people there who found their way out, who are telling their stories of survival and they're walking with you when that's, I was uh, that's the, so true oh, man when i was on the website the white flag app website i was looking through the blog and you know the sentence descriptions that go with each one were just each one would grip my heart and i kept reminding myself they're writing this having recovered that doesn't mean that life is perfect and will never be that again but they're reading this to give hope that things yep. can be better. So as you hear the depths and the breadth of all of this, as you hear the pain and the difficulties, you're hearing it from someone who is experiencing hope, who is experiencing yep. another day and exactly. another opportunity, another possibility. And that is the true miracle to me. And, and you hit it on the head and that's why i tell the story you know like again i'm still learning that it's a story right like i'm still like putting it all together and my father just told me about what he went through last year so but there are you know there are important lessons 
from trauma stories that should be learned. And, and there are heroes all along the way. And people don't understand always what that means to be a hero. But if you can impact somebody who is suffering slightly, I mean, do you need to know that you saved their life? Because I'm here to tell you, it's a good possibility that if you come across one of these four individuals who are suffering, your act of kindness, whatever it is, your break that you give them, whatever it is, may, may, be, it may end up being the story that they tell later. And, and, and what I mean by that is my, my, my lawsuit versus the city of Columbia went in front of a, a lower judge. And this, this individual, she was the first one to rule on whether or not the cops were wrong, the law is wrong, or I was wrong. And this individual, a judge, the federal judge, she ruled that I was wrong and the police were right. And I remember getting the update from my attorneys. And I just remember thinking to myself, it's a Friday. Just wait till Monday. Wait till Monday to end your life. And I remember going through the weekend and, and trying to put together what I had done to deserve what I'd been through. Because that's all it was at that point was, okay, God, universe, whoever, how did I, you know, please just at least tell me I was in the right. That's the only way I'll be able to survive this thing. So I meet with my attorneys at the beginning of the week and they say it gets reviewed by the upper judge and then he'll make the decision. And the upper judge, he ruled that the law was unconstitutional, that I had done nothing wrong and everything in between, but it took him three or four months to review. And it was the wor it was one of the worst and darkest times of my life. Flash forward to 2018, and I'm representing a client who was shot at by the police um, 29 times, hit nine times. And um, the case was to see if, you know, the police were in the wrong, if they operated, operated appropriately. And there was a surveillance video in that case showing that they acted inappropriately. So we kind of knew what, what was coming down. But it's a big case. It was the biggest civil rights case in the, in the history of the state at that time, Julian Betton, B-E-T-T-O-N. And that judge had to decide whether or not Julian was in the right or whether or not he was in the wrong, the same judge. And my heart sank and I thought he's going to go through the same thing because he's paralyzed and he's been through, he's been through, you know, multiple surgeries. You know, he's got rods in his legs. He doesn't really have much muscle. He's in a wheelchair. And I didn't want him to have to go through that question of, did I deserve, did I put myself here? And uh, she issued her opinion, and in her opinion, she quoted uh, the Mc Johnny McCoy versus the City of Columbia in her ruling that uh, my client did nothing wrong. And uh, I, I can't ever make it through that part because it's the heroes, you know. Like she didn't have to put that in there, but it's, it was the law at the time, and it was that nod, that gesture, that hey. What you've been through matters to other people. What you've been through matters to Julian Betton. It matters now. It didn't matter to those police and the prosecutors who came after you, but it matters now. And it didn't she, just matter. It became a yardstick. Right. It became a right. cannon. Right. And she has no idea what that did for me. I don't think, I mean, I don't really think I know yet, you know, if I have to look back on that time in my life and some of my notes and stuff, but it's the heroes. So if you're out there listening to this story and you're going, well, I, you know, I, I didn't go through all of that, but you know, I, I certainly empathize and you can empathize with me because it's not just, Hey, I went through all this trauma and, you know, I, you know, my life is harder. And I have you know, bigger, bigger mental health issues than you do. That's not it at all. Because we're all born uniquely, uh, in, you know, enshrined with genetics that will operate throughout the, the multitude of our lives. And without my father being arrested, without my mom, you know, coming into alcoholism, without me witnessing the suicide, and without me getting hooked on Xanax, I still would have been sick. And I still would have been able to look at you and hear your story and say, my God, what a struggle this human being is enduring. And I heard that there are heroes along the way. And I want to be one of those heroes. I want to be somebody who gives somebody a break when they need it the most. And, you know, that's what we hope that people can find on white flags, just a break.
just a moment of peace. I work a lot with psychologists and mental health professionals, and they share that the latest neuroscience shows how the brain can rewire itself, how the brain right. can make new connections and form new memories and new pathways. And one of the ways that happens in trauma victims is someone listening compassionately. Right. That is something each of us can do. You know, right. Marvel has, the Marvel Universe has us thinking that superheroes wear capes and can bend time and steal and all of these other things. But the real heroes are those everyday folks among us who listen with compassion. That Easing can suffering. change a lot. Forever, forever. It changes their life. It changes their wives' lives, their kids' lives. So, you know, I guess the message here is just give, you know, if you can give somebody a break this week, um, somebody who wrongs you or somebody who hurts you, just remember hurting people hurt people. And everybody looked at me as this arrogant, probably arrogant attorney with money and, you know, new suits on at the courthouse, but it was all a facade. It was all just me trying to survive if the money wasn't you know coming in and you know paying for these other things i'm using to cope with you know then those I'm other just, voices may have been right 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 exactly exactly so you know i i hope that um i hope that that individuals out there who can relate to my father for, you know being closed off and not discussing it you know just know that I am, a, you know, a child of the South and a child of secrecy and a child of, you know, let's, let's keep this, this within the family. Let's not even talk about it in the family. And I'm telling you, my brothers and I, it's a consensus. We would much rather hear from you what's really going on. So if you're there and, you know, you are in, 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 in your lashing out and let's talk real, let's talk real. you're hitting your spouse. Or let's talk real, you're abusing alcohol and you're showing up late for work. It can't get worse. So why not just start to try to talk about what it is that it's, it is underlying all of this negative energy that you're putting out into the, and, and violent energy that you're putting out into the universe because it's underneath all of that. That's your way out. This is your way out. It's finding out why you need to numb the pain. Well, and Johnny, by healing yourself, you have healed a whole family cycle, a generational cycle of abuse. It's going to have a different story now. Whether yeah, you have zero so. kids or whether you have 20 kids, by doing the work that you did on yourself and healing yourself and all of that that you faced, that story has a new chapter now that wasn't available before. Yeah. And, and I thank you for saying that it means a lot. And I, you know, I need to hear it because now I'm a CEO, you know, and as a CEO, your problems are supposed to be different. You're not supposed to have mental health issues. You know, you're not supposed to have all these other things. And so there, there, there's a lot of pressure to be perfect because I, I am representing the mentally ill in the workplace and, you know, I'm doing it vocally and I, I want that challenge. You know, I don't mind it to, to hear that, you know, this guy's practice law at a high level. I won a bunch of cases during all this time. You know, I would go ahead and say it. When I was struggling, I never lost a felony trial. And, you know, if you're sitting out there thinking, you know, mental illness means that you are in some way, shape or form, you know, deformed as a human being uh, socially or professionally or, or, you know, handicapped, you know, of the mind to where that you are not as useful. You're wrong. You're wrong. Because once I started healing, I started realizing that I have all this other creativity and, and uh, passion for stuff that I acquired along the way. And so when you're ready for your healing journey to begin, just know that it's not like a light bulb goes off. It's not rock bottom. It's just when you're ready for your life to get a little bit easier. That's when you start your journey. When you're ready to say, you know, talking about what I'm thinking about talking about what I'm going through is slightly easier than drinking and abusing and hurting. Once that becomes easier, once the talking becomes easier, that's when you start to heal. That's what most people think. 
if I could get it to you, hey, listen, even though it's the hardest thing you ever do, get out there and talk, go do it. If I could think that that would actually work, uh, you know, I would be more inclined to, to just go around and say, hey, you guys should start sharing. But the reality is people will start sharing when they realize that the cost of not doing it is just too much. Yeah, and I think something that's lost on us is all of these coping mechanisms that seem so life draining. They are life draining, but they're right. coping mechanisms. They help you to survive to the next day. They're ironically a comfort zone. Right. And the healing is uncomfortable. That's good, man. You're right on the money with that. It's incredibly uncomfortable. It's the most uncomfortable thing you ever do. And, you know, I'll tell you, I don't name names, but five tours of duty in Iraq, Fallujah, hardest thing he'd ever done was talk, talk about his feelings at that treatment place. And he would say it every day. And I was in a place where the worst of the worst were, mental, mentally ill-wise, you know. So you're not alone out there, guys. That's for sure. And um, you don't have to pretend to be uh, to be normal quote unquote, you don't have to pretend to be okay because it, it, you're, 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 you're fooling a fooler. The person who you're like, I don't want this person to know that I'm suffering. They are suffering and they would love to talk to you about their issues, just like they want to hear about yours. And if you ever run into somebody who one ups you and says, oh, you think that's bad? I've been through this, this, and this. Just know that person has not started their healing journey yet. They're not trying to offend you. They're not trying to belittle you or make your, uh, or make you feel less validated. That's a big word in the, you know, in the treatment. Just know that there's that person has the issue. Okay. Not you. So anytime that you are one up or you feel like, oh, I'm never going to talk about that again, because that's what my dad said. My dad said, I, I never want to talk about it again because I was told it wasn't a big deal. It's, it's just a death, but I'm here to tell you that your feelings are valid. And anything that you got to say, I want to hear it. And so do the other people on White Flag telling you. Thank you, Johnny. Thank you, Melissa.